Thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I just have to figure out how to work all of this. Here we go. I have disclosures, but they're not pertinent. So periprosthetic fracture is obviously a huge topic. We can talk about a bunch of different types of fractures, fractures above or below hips, fractures above or below knees. Uh, we could even talk about elbows, other sort of areas. I'm going to limit this just because of time. We only have 10 minutes uh, to fractures in the femur around total hips and total knees, as well as fractures of the patella. And I'll go kind of quickly because of the time. I do have a reference list. If anybody's interested, I'll put them out. I uh, just brought up about 30 of them. So uh, Bill mentioned that this is an epidemic. There's an awful lot of periprosthetic fractures out there. This is, a, this is an article that's about to be published, Journal of Arthroplasty by Cox et al. And it looks at the nationwide inpatient sample database on hips. And uh, just a couple of interesting findings. Two-thirds of the fractures in this database are female. And we're treating about 70% of them with ORAF and about 30% of them with revisions. Uh, actually, in this particular database, it didn't seem like the numbers were going up that quickly, but the costs were increasing at 8% a year. So what we're doing is costing more. Now, for those of you that treat periprosthetic fractures, basically, you know, anyone who takes call is going to see these things in the emergency room. And you may approach this from a bunch of different points of view. So obviously, you know, a joint replacement surgeon like myself is better at putting in new joints. A trauma surgeon like my associate is uh, better at putting on plates and screws. And then there's obviously, in our practice, we have sports medicine guys and hand guys taking general call, as well as generalists. And you may or may not be comfortable with this. And that's something that when you're approaching these fractures, you really need to kind of think about how you're going to approach them and what you need to have. Because obviously, the time to ask for a distal femoral replacement prosthesis is not when you're in the OR and you know, you're thinking you're going to put a plate on. So you've got to think about that in advance before you do the surgery and try to be prepared. I'll start off talking about periprosthetic fractures around total knees. And basically, if you look at it, there's a lot of different options. And I'm not sure that the final answer is out as far as which one of these is better. But obviously, we have locking and non-locking plates. You can use unicortical or bicortical screws. Uh, you can use cables of various types. So we have cables that go through plates, cables that go through eyelets on plates, and cables that you put around plates. And they all work to a greater or lesser extent. And then the kind of stuff that I think is more fun, which is revision implants. So you can use a distal femoral replacement, or you can use an allograft prosthetic composite, or you can just revise the existing knee with a long stem. And then, of course, there's a question of how IM nails fit into this whole thing. This is a classification that I think is useful. It's not a classification that people jump around about too much because it's kind of intuitive. But this is the Lewis and Rohrbeck classification for periprosthetic fractures about total knees. And basically, the first thing you can do is look at the, the type 3, which is a, any periprosthetic fracture around a loose total knee. So if your total knee is loose or failing and you get a periprosthetic fracture, it's going to markedly change your approach. So before you go in the OR, you want to be thinking about you know, what that patient's going to be like after their fracture has healed. So that's, a, that's always a type 3. Type 1s are basically 1s and 2s are ones where the the implant is, is intact and functioning well. It has to be both. And the uh, type 1 is a relatively non-displaced fracture. That's kind of easy to know what to do with that. The type 2 is a displaced fracture with an intact prosthesis. So I think it's kind of a simplistic uh, fracture classification. But in, in some respects, it works in terms of thinking about it. You can make the fracture classification a little more detailed. This was uh, published in 2006 by some of my associates at the Rothman Institute. Uh, and they break it down. It's a slightly different view. But basically, this is 1, 2, and 3 would be here. And then they basically, even though they did it 1A and 1B, it's basically a 3A and 3B. So the only difference is that this is whether the bone stock is good or the bone stock is not good. So that may change your management in terms of what kind of prosthesis you want to use. Probably a little more of a subtle difference in terms of classification. Just to, <clears throat> as we're thinking about this, just to kind of think about what you're going to get yourself into. So this is a distal femoral replacement. How many people here have done a distal femoral replacement? Now, there, actually, I think it's one of the easiest operations you do because you take everything out and just put something in. Uh, but a lot of people are very afraid of this. And there are, some, there are some technical points to using distal femoral replacements. And I do think you, know, you need to be thinking about that well before you go in the OR. And maybe if you're not comfortable doing a distal femoral replacement, you get somebody else to do it or get somebody to help you. This was actually a failed fixation 
that was sent to me. How many people here have done an allograft prosthetic composite? Yeah, maybe a little bit less. These are, these are less, these are kind of fun, but they're less common now because we have distal femoral replacement. So this is basically an allograft distal femur. You glue the more standard implant on the back table. You glue it into the uh, allograft, and then you kind of jam the whole thing into the femur. So these are more fun, but they're technically more difficult, and most people today don't really use it. So in terms of the per periprosthetic fractures around total knees, one of the, the most critical things, as I think I've already illustrated, is what's the condition of the implant? If the implant was loose or worn, and particularly ask the patient, was the implant painful pre-op? Because if they have a painful total knee and you go ahead and do a great job fixing their fracture, they're still going to have a painful total knee. Patient factor, fractures, uh, factors we were talking before the conference were just at breakfast about, you know, patients that we've sort of minimally fixed because they're very elderly and their demands are low. And also the type of implant, is there a box? And the box can get you two ways. Everybody thinks in terms of the box when they're doing a uh, rotting around an implant, but the box, some of the boxes are quite deep and they can affect your placement of your screws when you're trying to put a plate on. So those are just sort of things to talk about. I believe there's a presentation on plates versus rods, so I'll stop there. Periprosthetic hip fractures, periprosthetic femur fractures around total hips, Everybody pretty much knows the Vancouver classification. That's a classic classification. I think the good thing about it is it actually works, and it does really kind of tell you what to do. So the A's tend to be kind of minimal fractures. We'll talk about that in a second. The B's are fractures around the stems, and they're either stable or loose the stems, or in the case of a B3, it's a loose stem, but there's poor quality bone. And the C's are basically fractures of the femur that are treated much like periprosthetic fractures around the knee. So that's kind of a different deal. As with many classifications, the classifications have their problems. So you'll notice on this picture over here, this is a, uh, a, a B. And the question is, this is a B1 or a B2. It's a little hard to tell if the stem's loose and very osteoporotic bone. And there was a paper by Lindahl in 2006 that illustrated that there's not a lot of good inter-observer <coughs> concordance with classifying these fractures. And, you know, those of us who have been in practice for a while have either done this or had uh, one of their partners call them when they were going in to simply fix a, what they thought was a B1 fracture, and it turned out to be a B2 with a loose prosthesis. So the point is you better be ready. This is your toolbox for total hips. For fractures around total hips, you can use locking or non-locking plates. Once again, you can use cables. You can use revision implants, or you can do some sort of femoral replacement or APC. This is a Wagner-style stem with a bunch of wires. So that's just a revision implant, and obviously a, um, a uh, proximal femoral replacement has its role. This is a uh, paper by Dennis in 2000 looking at a biomechanical study of various uh, types of implants. And basically the hybrid implants with a lot of screws, maybe wires, locking may be of some benefit, seem to be most advantageous. This is just a little bit of a plea for less invasive techniques. Uh, Journal of Trauma 1999 by Farouk looks at the uh, damage to the circulation around the bone, and it seemed to be much better if you did a less invasive type of procedure, kind of like you see in this picture. So you see this is kind of a less invasive approach with, you know, you, uh, you do indirect reduction techniques and you put the plate in. Uh, treatment in total hips, the Vancouver A's are kind of interesting because if you just have a greater trochanter fracture, it makes a difference whether the patient fell on their trochanter or whether they have an osteolytic trochanter that's due to implant failure, and these really need to be treated with implant revision rather than just simply fixing the fracture. The C's, I already mentioned, they're distal, so you don't have to do much with them. Uh, that's different than any other femur fracture uh, above or below a total hip. The B's, for a B1, you're basically fixing the fracture, and it seems like unicortical screws, not just wires. Wires don't work quite as well. And then bicortical screws distally seem to work well. Uh, for the B2s, uh, you need to revise the stem. And for the B3s, where the bone quality is bad, you're kind of in a tough spot, and you're either doing a femoral replacement or some kind of bone grafting and uh, complex technique. So an overview for total hips, a rigid construct is most advisable. Uh, you, don't really can, you can't really tell sometimes pre-op whether it's a B1 or B2. Compression is a good idea. Be prepared with an alternate plan if you're doing a B1 and uh, try not to devascularize the fracture. That's kind of an overview. The problem with dealing with the proximal femoral fractures is that you may need to do a lot of other things, and if you're not comfortable with extended trochanteric osteotomies, uh, 
if you're not ready to contour your allografts to make them fit well, if you haven't used any of these complex Wagner stems or, or certainly allograft prosthetic composites, you need to really kind of think about whether you take these on. Just to finish kind of on time here, patella fractures around total knees really kind of stink. They don't heal well. There is a classification that's out there. I'm not sure how useful it is. Obviously, a stable implant with an intact extensor mechanism is treated non-operatively. Uh, as soon as you, the extensor mechanism is disrupted, then you need to think about revision. And whether you save the patella or not may have to do with how much bone remains. Uh, this is one that we did that we fixed, and then it failed. So then we went ahead and excised the proximal pole and reconstructed the extensor mechanism. So these can be challenging. And probably the worst fractures are, just a quick note, are acetabular fractures around total hips. These are really in the domain of the, of the re, uh, experienced revision hip surgeon or experienced acetabular surgeon. These can be quite difficult to repair. There's a lot of different technology out there that can help you, and I would be very cautious about taking these on if you haven't had a lot of experience working around the pelvis. So in conclusions, be prepared. As always, this is an area of orthopedics where being prepared is very helpful, particularly in the Vancouver B1s. Those are kind of the ones to think about. Always have a backup plan. And definitely consider your abilities in these cases. You don't have to do every one of these cases, and there are situations where it may be better to punt. Let somebody else help you. Thank you very much.